Production funding for this program is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Preston Giacomo. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad you found us. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a lady who has made a difference in Memphis. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Joyce Cobb. Welcome. Hi. Tom. <laughs> you can't, I, it's okay. I can't pronounce it either sometimes. <laughs> but you just had your 70th birthday. Sure did. June 2nd. You have come a long way from Okamulgee. Ok Okamulgee. Oklahoma. And that's Oklahoma. where your mama's family's that's from, That's right? my mother's folks. Okay. My, tell, tell me about your mom and dad and your brothers and sisters. Well, uh, the, my mother's folks come from Sierra, Sierra Leone mm -hmm. to Carolina right. coast and they trailed tears to Louisiana, Arkansas, and settled in Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, father's folks came from, I think, Kentucky, Missouri, and uh, settled in uh, uh, mother's, my father's mother's people, Jellico, uh -huh. the Appalachian, I think that's Jellico, Tennessee. Right. Um, and more Scottish Irish. Wow. Okay. Because, you know, right. that's America. And uh, settled in Jefferson City, um, Missouri, and they all were seeking that educational route. And, and they're all educators, right? All I mean, educators, your whole family? All, all the way to the great-grandfather great who started a school, and you can look it up. Okay. It's, it's called, uh, it was called the Cobb uh, uh, School, and it was post-slave um, era, mm. and... Um, existed all the way to 1952. Let me let me just tick off a few things and you tell me if I'm right or wrong. You are uh, you are currently a teacher. Yes. Um, you are currently a performer. Yes. You also do volunteer radio. Yes. My therapy. And, and yep. your your addiction to music came when? How old oh, were, how I'm old were you? 4 years old. I did a number called The Moon Belongs to Everyone. The best <laughs> things in life are free. Uh, four years old, and people... Where, where were you? In Oak, Oak Moggy, uh -huh. in my grandmother's church. On a stage? Oh, a in a church. In, in church, AME uh, church. And um, the people just stood up and applauded, and I said, <laughs> they like me, they really like me. And I'm saying, this is the way to go. That's, and uh, became addicted, really, to so acceptance. That's amazing. People like you. And, and then, you sang. so you took piano lessons? Did you ever take voice lessons? I never really took, my voice lessons was during my grade school, high school years at Cathedral of the Incarnation in Nashville. Okay. All girls school, but we were in a all girls choir. Right. Uh, we would sing, uh, it was the headquarters for the archbishop. So we had to learn a lot of pontifical high masses. Right. We had to learn the requiem masses and the, chants. And, and the chants, and I'm thinking this is where my my nurturing, this is where the training came. I was always placed in the second alto section, Yay. which I thought was very difficult mm -hmm. because it's something that you have to hear uh, or, or read. Uh, but it's sort of in between the alto and the and the sopranos, and you know it really makes the difference in the voicing. And after you graduated from the high school, you went to where? That's when I said, enough. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to a party school. You know? Did you really? It, it was pretty much party. You know, it was, uh, I mean, it's serious. But right, of it was course. Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio. At that time, there were only seven uh, universities, colleges and universities that had uh, where you could major in social welfare. And that's what your major was? Get a was? degree in social welfare as opposed to sociology. Okay. <clears throat> and so that was recommended by my high school counselor oh, who thought I you know, scored pretty well on the ACT test of social science. Oh, yeah. So, uh, the, you know, I, I, I heard her on that decision. When did you pick, pick up your music again? Um, after college. I got my first job, Montgomery County, Dayton, Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, as a social worker. I had, I had six daycare centers under the OEO program at that time 
it, <laughs> it was a job. Uh, but I met this guy named Bill Timmy who lived in, you know, when you get out of college, you get your first apartment mm -hmm. and you're on your own I and you've you got your job and you got your uh, new car and uh, your new apartment. And he was coming on the elevator with a gu guitar. And I said, oh, do you play? And yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. So we, we hooked up and started rehearsing in the basement of the apartment building. Mm -hmm. So I said, man, let's go out and audition for some jobs. And so we first place we went was Ramada Inn. So where it's did you true. get to play in, in, in the Ramada Inn? We, we Inns, traveled I mean. everywhere. We traveled Wisconsin. We traveled Illinois. We traveled uh, Michigan. Did you like life on the road? I loved it. I mean, every hotel was home. Right. And, uh, you, you know, you set up and you stay because we stayed for months. We both played guitar. And he was white, I was black. So that was a great selling um, What year was this? What years thing. Was that? Uh, I think it was like, it had to be, what, 72, maybe? Okay. You know? So um, we stayed together until the wife says, I'm tired of the road, right. uh, I want a home, I want to start a family. Good for her. And so the Timmys, uh, we, we separated at that point. Um, and you went back to fun. Nashville? I went back to Nashville because why not? I mean, the music That's city, a, USA. And you sang connection. country music for a while. I was singing country music, be, number one, because I liked it. I grew up on Dolly Parton and right. Porter Wagner and the Hager brothers and the Wilburn brothers. And uh, I was comfort comfortable with it. I'm just as about I'm about as comfortable with country music as I am with blues. Uh -huh. You know, it's not really the core of me, um, but I can do it. Was Stax your first recording contract? It was my first recording contract. Yes, it was. Jim Stewart uh, was very interested in starting a subsidiary Jim label. Jim Stewart of Stax. Yes, and you know he was a country and western player. Right. Um, and uh, he was looking for another label under Stax, to and he needed uh, uh, artists to sign up. So and you I were think. the last person. We were, you were, to yeah, I was the last to sign with uh, Stax Records. With Stax Records. I, when I when I came to Memphis, I was overwhelmed. First of all, I met Memphis in Nashville. I was at a party and I heard Hot Buttered Soul, Isaac Hayes. Uh -huh. I, st I, stay, I stood up and I said, where did this music come from? <laughs> I had no idea. And someone said, Memphis. So that was my initial falling in love with Memphis. And then when I came to Memphis um, to work, uh, after the Stax deal closed, I was very depressed. I went to the river. I meditated. Do I stay in Memphis? Do I go back to Nashville? I love the way the city was built on the river. And I said, I think I'm going to kind of uh, hang around because I saw the bar caves with, they had a python around their <laughs> neck, you know. Your love is like the Holy Ghost. And I'm saying, oh my God, this, I've got to stay here. The, the diversity. The influences of black music is what I didn't have in Nashville. It was jazz. It was Bill's Twilight on North Parkway, which was the jazz club, and everyone met there. It was my uh, second uh, engagement in Memphis that, that was continued through maybe several years. I mean, that was the place. I met B.B. King at Bill's Twilight. and. Uh, um, he gave me his uh, home address uh, in that Vegas. That was pretty cool. He said, you're a people's entertainer. There you go. And I never could figure that out. But now I, I get it. I came to Memphis uh, in a transitional uh, period. Bill Street was boarded. And then Elkington came and, and reinvented. Right. Let's talk about your club, Joyce Cobbs, which was an anchor on Beale Street, oh, wasn't man, it? Oh, man, that was a gift how did that from happen? the gods. I mean, it, John, John Anderson. Johnny came, Robertson. Johnny Robertson came to me just in the middle of the day and said, I want you to have a club. <laughs> and, of course, I didn't ask why. You know, I'm saying, me? I, and, and I went home and I named all these names. We could name it. The Music Box, uh, Lunsford's, whatever. Um, and um, he says, no, I want it to be named Joyce Cobbs. How about that? 
Did your mother appreciate the fact that your name was in lights finally? Did oh, well, you know, she was impressed, of course. Um, but um, it wasn't like, I'm so excited. Oh, this right. is wonderful. You know, mothers are curious right. and suspicious. And why is this? And what? how did she get this? Yeah, you know, that, that's what deal? mothers do. Right. But it was a gift. It was a gift. It was where I, all, my only responsibility was not in food and beverage. It was totally Johnny Robinson's project. Uh, it was connected with Alfred's, right. which was his um, his real money maker. His, it was his vision. He saw it, it before was his anybody vision. else did. Yeah. We, had, we had major names without the pain of financing these guys. They just heard the music and wanted to come. I had the Hot Fun Band, which was the, the, the most terrific band of my life um, that uh, we really got together in the studio of Shoe Productions. Right. Uh, writing for years and came out really tight and everybody said, what is this band? They're great. But it, we, we got together in the studio. They were the studio band of Shoe Productions. Now, was that the band that was called Hot Fun? Hot Fun with uh, <laughs> Joyce Steve, Cobb and Hot Steve Fun. Potts, uh, on Gene Nunez on guitar, Dave Smith on bass, and Lanny McMillan on saxophone. And it was the most exciting, I must say, uh, a period of music. And uh, we were together for maybe 10 years. I remember it well. Um, we are also um, featured the, the, Noki Taylor and, oh. um, and Sonny Williams uh, in the jazz elements. Of, you see, because I could always go pop, jazz, country, rock and roll. What made you lean to that versatility? What, what was the tip off to you to realize that, that if you could play everything, you could work everywhere? Nashville got me ready for that because okay. I had I literally integrated a lot of clubs in Nashville that hadn't been and to sing Tammy Wynette songs made me acceptable here again we go with the applause and the acceptance whatever right. you know I will sing what you want if <laughs> you just love me <laughs> so that's that's how it started it's it's a it's a survival mode it's an artist that you have to do what you have to do if you don't have a major record label right. that's telling you what to do and uh, or how to do. So it, it was a survival uh, situation I learned in Nashville. Before we leave this part of Beale Street, I want to mention to people when they walk down Beale Street, if they go right in front of where Wet Willie's is yeah. now, you'll be able to see Joyce Cobbs. Johnny Robertson, once again, it happened without me even knowing it. Joyce has a note on Beale Street. Beale, I just a, want to a make note sure on Beale Street. That, that people are aware of yes, that. Yes, so. yes, and I am so blessed. You are. I am mostly blessed because of the community of fans and musicians that have supported me. You know, sometimes when you live through it, it's so close. It's, it's like your hand to your nose, and you just wake up, you take advantage of the fact, and you don't know the influences that you're giving or the, the joy or the music that the people enjoy. Uh, people from out of town, people from Europe, you know, all of this exposure that Bill Street brought to me um, and, and the support, the music community well, support, you know, the, it's unbelievable. One of the things that's amazing about your career is, is I had the opportunity to, to look through everything is the fact that you never really had a major recording contract and yet you managed to make a life and a living out of music. Yes, and I think it's because of what my father said years ago when, when we were in high school, learn the American pop book. Okay. Because he, you know, he was a jazz bebop swing guy and he was belonged to the Columbia Record Company where he got albums every, every month. month. Uh, and he was in it, and I uh, always said that my dad w was a wannabe drummer. He, he wanted to play right? with me. That was what he wanted to do. But, um, yeah, he told me to learn the book, and that book, that American pop book, the Gershwins, the Cole Porters, um, the Hoagie Carmichaels, learn those songs, and they will carry you all the way to the grave. They really, and it's true. 
That knowledge, I think, was the edge that I had in both cities, Nashville. It got me into the Teddy Bart show, the Ralph Emery show, the live band shows, the, Memf the Nashville symphonies. It got me to Opryland because they were using those kind of materials of the American pop book. It, so I, I teach kids, learn the American pop book and it will carry you through the disco era, the rock and roll era, uh, whatever the fad is of music per decade. It will carry you through all of those. I know where I can find you on Sundays. How long, oh, beautiful how long place. have you played? I tell you. At Bosco's. Uh, we've been there maybe uh, 16, 17 years. We started off with just th three of us. It was, <laughs> it was like me and Jimmy Arnold on guitar and upright bass with Mike Adams. We do everything from the book, American Pop Book, to the Stax book, to the Sun book, and everything else that we can, uh, we like to do. Right. And it, it has worked. Uh, Bosco's is just a wonderful place, a warm place for me, and mm. has really done an outstanding job of loving me uh, during during this time period of my life. Well, we can talk about that now. Yes. Do you want to you want to give me your hat? Yeah, it's time to claim. That's it. When How you like that? I, I think you look great. I tell you, all your hats are too big for you. That's it. <laughs> when you cut your hair, the hair really holds the hat. You know? When were you diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? Uh, I think, well, um, it was around, you know, it was around Thanksgiving. Of or last maybe, year? Maybe Christmas. Okay. So that's about six months ago. 2014, yeah, that's yeah. well, about six months. I thought it was something I had eaten. You know how you eat somebody else's dressing? Uh-huh. During the <laughs> You say, oh, it's the dressing. Well, or in my oh. case, uh, the way I cook yeah. ramen noodles. But. Right. So, <laughs> so I had this pain, and it is, you know, sometimes you have pain and you live through it. This pain made me go to the doctor. And, uh, of course, uh, they ran CT scan and, and saw that... I had a mass tumor on the head of the pancreas. Me, to me, the pancreas looks like a baby whale. It, ha <laughs> it has a head, and then it has a body, then it has a tail. Mm -hmm. And the fortunate thing is I had it on the head. The unfortunate thing about the pancreas is that it's hard to get to. Okay. It sits behind the stomach and, and the, the spinal. So uh, it was a little hidden monster there that probably had been there and not knowing, because I had had this pain before okay. and just thought it was something I ate. Gas. <laughs> yeah, gas that you can't release. That's, right. that's the pain of the pancreas. And so uh, from that time uh, at the West Clinic under the diagnosis of uh, gastro ones, you know, head on from there. And Who's your doctor at West Clinic? Dr. Tower. Kurt Tower? Kurt Tower. Excellent job. And uh, dare not go against him. No. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no he's pretty, he's, he says, I'm science guy, okay? So don't don't bring in these uh, turkey tail mushroom stuff. Right. You know? I only go for the chemo and for the surgery and that's it. And the chemo works, and it has. Uh, Excellent. How many? They can't find the many, tumor on the head. It's gone. Uh, it's gone from the pancreas. From the pancreas, but, but there's a lymph node that they're concerned. You know, so it's a battle every day, and you can't really make plans right. on when it'll be over. Um, it was it was very very intense because, you know, Doctor Towers he says, well, this is a hard one. Right. You know, and I'm saying, oh my God. And then, you know, when the doctor comes and holds your hand, you know, you're saying, oh, my God, am I going to die? Uh, but, you know, he was he, they're very truthful at the West Clinic. Yes. And and Dr. Um, uh, Praxton uh, Dixon was going to be the surgeon. And he gave me all the truths. About you mean the surgical procedure that he, goes the, with the, pancreatic the, the cancer? The surgical procedure. And that's called, called the Whipple. Whipple. And uh, <clears throat> I sort of resigned from that decision. You see, the thing about when you're con confronted with life and death situation about you, that's when it, the reality of living and dying really comes. And so, you now, if I live without, well, you have maybe six months to a year. Okay. 
if I live with, well, maybe you have six months to maybe 12 years or 20 years. In 20 years, I'll be 90. 90. And I'm, I'm saying, what the hell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be 90, I can go anywhere I want, you know? But I decided to go the medical route to listen to my doctor and to do the things that they know will work. And uh, I feel great. I have no complaints. I see others at the clinic. By the way, me and Hank play music. I'm, I'm going to get yeah, to that. Well, you you go ahead and finish your yeah, story, but, and then I'm yeah, going to yeah. let people know that you do a show while you're getting dripped. Yeah, we do a show while we're getting dripped, in, which is the real meaning of music, is to emote others and make them happy. And it helps us, too. Right. Helps Tell them who Hank is. Hank Sable is a part of the Bosco uh, group mm -hmm. that you would see if you came to Bosco. He's the fiddle player, mandolin. Right. But I see so many others that are in pain and uh, possibly have to have surgery and uh, limited in their life. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I'm saying how blessed I am for this stage of cancer. Um, because I'm painless, I have no pain, and uh, the chemo can be rough, you know, it's toxins in your body, yep. it kills the good and the and bad, bad cells, everybody, so I'm, you know, I'm living with it, and uh, slight discomforts, other than that, it's Now let's good. talk about your chemo, you walk in, you and Hank walk in, right? Does he just play he percussion? Plays, he plays. He plays uh, guitar. He brings his guitar in. Yeah, and and, and you guys do and, a show. And and we 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 do music. We just do one tune after another, and we do harmony. And he does a lead song. I do a lead song. And people sit there and they close their eyes and they're you know they're getting their drip and they're getting their chemo and they're coming in and out and. Some of them are sleeping and they're wrapped in blankets because it's very cold in the in the um, in the room, chemo room. You have to keep it very cold, so you have to wrap up in blankets or dress warm when you, you know, sit there for a couple of hours. Uh, the nurses are happy. The doctors, you know, they float in and out and they're smiling. And um, then we have the patients. They come up to us and they say, "Thank you for your music. It's it just." helped my time here you yeah. know so much better and then you when you walk out you really know the meaning of your existence that is you give light to those that are in the dark exactly. and it also gives light to our spirit you know it it and it gives light to me it helps my condition um, to be uh, tolerable you know and uh so uh, it's it's just everything, man. It's just everything is a blessing, you know. If I if I had to add on to my life right now, I I wouldn't think of a, a thing that that I could. The only thing I regret is that I majored in social welfare right. because uh, I'm thinking I should have majored in music. Uh, mm -hmm. I was there with 14 years of piano, and it would have been quite easy because I knew the theory at the time and I, and I had my chops were up right um, and I think it would have carried me a longer way in my musical career if I had kept my uh, my piano up right I would have been playing like Diane, Diane Price, Price. <laughs> I loved her so much and she, I, I have to say that uh, there's 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 a void in the city without her. I agree. Man, it really is. But uh, she was my mentor. We're coming to the end here. Yes. The music industry has been going through big changes. Everything's different so, for the last couple of decades, and they haven't always been in favor of the artist. Uh, you tell me as you teach at the University of Memphis and Rhodes College. Not only do you teach improvisation and technique, yeah. what do you teach them about the future? What what do you what insight do you give them, or would you give anybody who's watching us today? Well, it's just that be true to yourself on the passion, because the money might not come. Uh, the applause might not come. But your passion, your love, the reason that you go to MJO and you sing Sinatra, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a passion that will not ever 
stop. And yeah. and uh, and you're so blessed to have it filled. That's what I tell them. I also tell them to learn as much uh, music, learn as much genres of music. Mm -hmm. Learn the American pop music. Learn the jazz book. Learn the, the rock and roll. Learn everything that, that you can. But the most important is writing. I admire Keith Sykes, I write, the writers in Memphis. Uh, Teeny Hodges, all of that, everything that was created out of Memphis musically, uh, Johnny Cash, write, write your music. Uh, but if you question yourself about your passion, and if it's not there, don't force it. You, know, you have to have the passion to want it and pursue it. In our closing minutes, is there anything you want to say to anybody or anything at all? Since it's a, it's been a conversation, would you like I would like, like to? to thank you no. for inviting me here to talk to the city and, and to thank the city for their wonderful support in many ways. Um, they are healing me, and I feel so healed because of Memphis, the community of music and uh, fans and friends. Thank you. And, I, and thank God for my family, a good family. This has been a conversation with, with Joyce Cobb. Thank you for being with us here at WKNM.